Hello everybody, welcome to Online Trade Academy's webinar on Millennials, a topic we haven't done a lot of conversation with over the years, but you know what, it's been growing in popularity. We've had so many requests, we thought, why don't we break down this misunderstood generation, or maybe there are some truths behind all the things that we hear that Millennials are just lazy, they don't want to do anything, they're looking for handouts, they don't want to buy homes. Well, is there truth to that? We'll dive into a lot of facts and statistics on that and hopefully open up your uh, perspectives on a little bit and, and enlighten you on what we uh, need to know about millennials. So today's webinar topic is millennials, money and myth, the landscape of a generation. Today we'll be doing this one live, so it's fully interactive. So hello everybody out there and uh, I believe I have to give a shout out to uh, Adrian real quick because he says I'm part of Generation X and I don't exist. I'll let you know that we do in fact exist, and I am part of Generation X, so Adrian, I'm right there with you. You know why we just don't get all the attention? Because Generation X is the best one. All right, that's maybe next month's webinar topic. We'll be on Gen X. Let's uh, show you some polls and do some interactivity here on what we've had at Online Training Academy. So, we've got uh, our first poll up here. It says, what age, uh, what, at what age is the average millennial financially independent? thought this one was kind of interesting because we had 34, 26, 29, and 31. And a vast majority of you put 34. God, I just feel like that's a that's kind of old to be financially independent. Uh, well, the the numbers are pretty much spot in line with that one. Now let's take a look real quick at what these generations are. So Ruben says, "Who's X?" Let's check it out. Here we are. The greatest generation, I think that's a self-titled moniker there, was before 1928. The silent generation is 28 to 45. Baby boomers are 46 to 64. Of course, they are starting to shrink in number. Generation X, which is my generation, is 65 to 80. Uh, millennials, which we'll discuss today, is 81 to 96. Now, it's funny because some sources will differ on what exactly these numbers are uh, where, with regards to their start and end point, but we're using 81 to 96 as a millennial. And then the one that we'll probably have to talk about in a few years is Generation Z. Notice population-wise, they are already the largest out there, and uh, they will definitely be an influencer later on, but we'll focus on the millennials. Now, I want to start off by giving us a little bit of history to understand exactly who millennials are, because part of the reason that they are the way they are is because they were shaped by societal events that happened. So first off, if they're from 80, 81 to 96, <laughs> yes, Carlos, you're, you're a millennial, uh, 81 to 96, that basically is their birth range. So what I wanted to show you real quick is if we fast forward, during the market boom from 96 to 2000, then the subsequent crash from 2000 to 2003, and then again the market crash in 2008, millennials were between 15 years old and 30. So right away you know that they're going to have some issues with the financial markets. Why? Because they watched their parents lose half of their money twice. Not once, but twice. So that would probably be part of the reason that millennials are very skittish with regards to investments, and I'll show you some facts and figures here to back that up, uh, but wanted to set that stage. Now, let's look one step further, which is what's the future hold for millennials? So let's go back to our chart here. This is the S&P 500 going back to 1981 to 2019, and we still have, the, there's the born rage, 81 to 96, but here's what's interesting. If you look over the course of a lifetime for millennials, of course, they're looking to start to retire in 2046. Obviously, that's a very big gap between where we are now and where they start to retire. The problem is there's 27 years of uncertainty. Now, of course, all of us, whether you're a boomer, Generation X, uh, silent generation, there's always areas of uncertainty. But right now, this is the, the area of concern for millennials, and there's a lot of major issues facing them. So. What are some of those challenges and concerns that millennials face? Well, there's quite a few of them from the research that we've done. And again, I want to thank my research team out there for helping out put all this stuff together because there's just tons of facts and figures. Probably the first and foremost is this belief system that the end is near for Social Security, that benefits are due to decrease in 2033 or maybe even be gone altogether. I don't know how many of you watching right now believe it, but how many of you believe that Social Security is going to disappear and just evaporate? Well, the numbers released by the Social Security Administration in 2014 said, we will run out of money by 2034. Here you can see the table that they released in their report, and it was at about $2.79 trillion in the, in the bank accounts as of 2014, but they're forecasting that by 2034, they will run out of money. So basically, anybody who's retiring after 2034, you get nothing. Well, 
let's take a step back here. Do you think for a second that your elected officials would let that happen? Because if they did, who would vote them out of office? You and I would, right? So they will make changes. They probably are going to uh, increase the Social Security tax on your payroll. They're probably going to extend the time for when you can retire. So instead of 65 or 62 at the earliest for Social Security, they'll probably make it 65 at the earliest, but you're really looking at 70 to retire because we're living longer. So let's stretch that out. Um, they may also uh, adjust the uh, cost of living index to modify these numbers a little bit. So there's tweaks that will be made. So when we look at that, what people are calling a fact that Social Security is going to run out, I'm calling it a myth. I think that they're going to make adjustments to it and it will be there. It will be modified in some way, uh, but I don't think it's going to completely collapse. The view that we have as Online Training Academy is you should do this. You should pretend and live your life as though Social Security will not be there. Plan your finances according. Make the right investments because if you get to that point of retirement and you have your nest egg all set and then Social Security just happens to be there, that's just icing on the top with a little cherry too. So pretend it doesn't exist, but don't be fearful of Social Security not being there. It most likely will be. All right, our next concern is the robots. The robots are coming. We keep hearing about automation is going to replace all of these jobs. Yes, this is true. It is going to replace certain jobs. But what we've experienced, it's, it's kind of like saying that the car uh, ruined areas of our economy. Yeah, it, it did. It changed it. It didn't ruin it. It changed our economy and, and new jobs arose around that automa automobile. We're going to see new jobs created around the robotics industry. There will be new jobs created. So if you're fearful that your job is going to disappear because of robots, well, what you need to do is retrain yourself. You need to get yourself in another profession. Find something where those robots might not be of impact or where you might actually be working with the robots. So again, I'm calling that a myth. It's factual robots are coming, but it's not going to displace your jobs uh, without creating new ones out there. All right, next one, basic needs. This is an interesting one. What we've read with all this research is that millennials are very concerned. They are really heavy in what are called ESG funds. These are environmental, social, and governance funds. They're actually 66% more likely to invest in those, or 66% of millennials choose those funds, which is over double others. Why? Because they're very concerned about things like food shortages. Yes, we are seeing populations grow significantly. Therefore, uh, there may be food shortages. Of course, we are changing with GMO and things like that. You also have water shortages. This is a report that was put out by unwater.org uh, showing that there's 60% more food needed by 2050 than there is today. And of course, today that was 2013 is when I got this report from. So, uh, that significant increase obviously means we're going to have food problems, but water becomes very, very critical. Uh, we actually did a power trading radio show a couple years back with a, a water publicly traded company because we thought this is going to be like Mad Max at some point, right? Instead of gas, it's water is going to be our precious resource. So they're very concerned with the natural resource side of things. So we'll call that a reality. We'll say that, yeah, food shortages and water is definitely a potential issue for millennials. Of course, it's a potential issue for us all. I wanted to show a couple graphics here to help further support that and, and show you some areas of maybe potential opportunity. This is one that kind of came up in our research and I thought it might be worth uh, sharing with everybody here because to me this is crazy. Um, when you look at the amount of food that we waste per year, so we talk about food shortages, but look at the amount of food that we waste just in the production process and I'll focus on North America here. They're wasting in the food production process, about 180 kilos, that's kilograms, so you're looking at uh, what, three, six, call it 400 pounds per person per year in producing our food gets wasted. But then as consumers, we're wasting about uh, just a little over 100 kilograms. That's about 220 pounds per person that you and I waste every year in food. And I, I'm embarrassed to say that that is probably accurate. We can definitely work on these things. And I know that millennials are actually trying to find jobs. This is one of the main things I learned about millennials is they're really looking for jobs where they feel that they're having an impact, that they're making a difference. This is an area I definitely think that they'll be headed into is what can we do to help improve these social or, or food issues, or water issues to help improve things. So that was one of the concerns. I want to show that fact there. Here's one more. We know that water is an issue, but there are certain spots around the world where it's becoming increasingly more challenging. Of course, with the water risk, this is what uh, the WRI org 
program put together. It's just a report of water risk, which is basically where they start to have issues with their water. Now, you know, United States and Canada and uh, Siberia are probably doing okay. We do have some hot spots, including where I'm at in Southern California, where I'm required to have a lawn, which is awkward in the middle of a desert. Um, but you see around in Asia and India, where we have the, the highest populations in the world, are having major water issues. Now, um, this isn't the first time we've had major water issues. You go back to 2015, uh, Sao Paulo was on the brink of what's called zero day. So was Chennai in 2018 and South Africa was basically there in Cape Town just recently. Zero day is where basically the government comes in and says we have to start implementing a full system of regulating water because of issues. We, we just don't have enough water for people. We're getting close to that in a lot of major cities. Hopefully the millennials can help find a solution to that because that's their purpose. All right, uh, let's go to the financial side of things because obviously you want to know what the interests are and what are some of the problems for millennials. We talked about this one at the very beginning, which was that millennials are very cautious. And the reason I believe that is is because they were burned twice. They weren't burned, but their parents were burned twice. So there's this apprehension towards investing. And I will show you some facts and figures here in just a second, which are very interesting with regards to their investing habits. Um, it's definitely a change from what I learned when I was in college and the, the norms that boomers and Gen X um, are following. So the reality is, yes, they are very cautious. I'll show you some of that here in just a second with some facts. Now, Let's talk about one of the major ones. And I'm going to see if I can get you guys to participate. So uh, I got a lot of activity. So hello, everybody. I'll, I'll try to read through um, the, the comments here at the end. I'd love to get a feedback from you. What do you think is the largest area of debt for millennials? Okay, we know right now. Go ahead and type it in chat. What do you think is the largest area of debt for millennials? Okay, we know that they have historic amounts of college debt versus previous generations, and there's also a big difficulty in paying off that debt. So type in a chat, what do you think is the, the biggest challenge for millennials with regards to debt? Are we talking, is it, is it car debt? Is it home debt? Is it uh, college debt? Is it credit card debt? What's the most challenging one that you think? Let's see if we get that feedback here. So. Part of the reason that millennials have so much debt, it's a cyclical problem. It's not like, hey, they just are irresponsible and spend a bunch of money. I think that disbelief, we have, to, we have to dispel that belief system right there because it's not that they're really irresponsible with their money just buying whatever they want. They have less money to start with. So it's almost like saying you're starting a race, but you're 50 feet behind everybody when you start. The national average for income, and this is by 2015, I wish I had some more current numbers, but it's pretty darn close was 46,790. Boomers in the greatest generation or this, uh, were at 46,000. Generation X, which is mine, because we're hard workers, we're up at the 50,000 mark. We make more than anybody. That's right, buddy. And then look at millennials. I mean, they're right behind Gen X, but they're $16,000 less in income. That's a problem, and I'll show you why that is here. Now, great, a lot of you guys are, okay, this is awesome. You guys are great. Look at all this participation, this is fantastic. We're led to believe that it's student loans and, and college. And most of you are putting that, right? Student loan, student loan, student loan. It's actually credit card debt. And if you know anything about the, the issues with regards to personal growth, credit cards are one of the worst things on the planet. Other than a loan shark, it doesn't get much worse than credit cards. They get up to 25% interest on these things. So you could run a $10,000 balance on your credit card, which doesn't seem like a lot of money, but you're paying 25% interest per year. Good luck getting out from underneath that one. So keep this one in the back of your mind that millennials, one of the biggest challenges they have is credit card debt. Not necessarily student loans. Yes, it's higher than normal, but their credit, is, uh, student credit cards is extremely high. So, you can imagine the problem there. It's a conundrum that you put yourself into right away. If you have really high debt obligations, college, right? We are student loans. They're, they're one of the smartest generations as well. We'll give them that because they're spending so much money on education, but they're also racking up a ton of debt. Is that a bad thing? Student loans, you know, you're looking at five to 6%. That's not the end of the world. That's okay. It's the credit card debt, which is the double digit to up to 25% or even more, potentially. That's the killer. And when you have less money, you can't service that debt. So here lies this spiral. So what do they have to do to make their obligations? Take on more debt and it gets more and more dangerous. Now, there is a solution, which is, uh, was shocking to me when I looked at these numbers. There is a solution for this, but millennials have a belief system that needs to change. And I'll get to that in a sec. Awesome. Thank you guys for all the participation. I got like a, <laughs> a couple hundred people signing that one. 
Uh, Robert says, cash is king. That is absolutely a millennial belief system. Okay, so here's what we did for one of our other polls. Uh, were you born between 1981 and 1986? If so, what is your top financial concern? How to invest or how to save? I, I was kind of surprised on this one because what we hear in the media is that they're just bad at saving, they just spend. That's not a concern for millennials. Uh, what they're more concerned with is how to invest. And I think that that is a reflection of what we showed you twice already, which is this big market correction. My parents lost half of everything twice. Not a good thing. I want to not go through that same pitfall. So what has happened is millennials are saving in cash more than any other generation. It's a real shock that you know you have the boomers, you have silent generation, you have Generation X, both feel or all feel that uh, stock market is really the best way to grow their wealth. Millennials are going to cash. That is a problem because you're just losing money. You are literally losing money by sitting in cash. So uh, there, there are a bunch of reports from Wells Fargo, from BlackRock, we're pointing to up to 60% of a millennial's wealth may be tied up in cash. That is wasted money. So you'd rather keep your money in cash, which is making you nothing, but I'm going to hold credit card debt, which is charging me 25% interest, or student loans, which are 6% interest. Bad idea. Pay off those credit cards as soon as possible. Pay off that student loan as soon as possible, and then start hoarding cash. But get yourself out from underneath this because you're just paying interest, which is going to make your, your net worth decline, not increase. All right, other challenges. So saving, I mentioned this one. There's a belief system that millennials like to live for today, right? They want to go travel around the world, maybe work a part-time job, and then uh, take a couple months off, and then come back and find another part-time job. Well, to some extent, there is some truth there, but I think it's a little bit blown out of proportion. It's a generalization for the entire generation. Uh, that's not true. But millennials do have a tendency to live now. They have a tendency to spend much more lavishly on move. Um, meals and food and things like that. For example, 60% of millennials will buy a cup of coffee that costs more than four bucks compared to only 40% of generation Xers and 29% of baby boomers. That's 60% of people going to buy a $4 cup of coffee. If you just went to McDonald's and bought a dollar cup of coffee, you're saving yourself 75%. Think about the money you're spending and wasting on these things. So if we look at the economic downturn that wiped out their parents, part of this thing is I believe millennials are driven to think that they must keep cash. That's a Great Depression type of mentality because when everything was going to hell in a handbasket, people were keeping money under their mattresses, in their shoebox, etc. Millennials are kind of falling around in that same category. Now here's what's interesting. We all know that we want to have savings, right? You want to have a, certainly an emergency fund, which is, should be several months of your monthly income just to cover any uh, emergencies or necessary expenses that may come up should you lose your job or become um, uh, out of work. However, millennials, as we showed you earlier, don't have the salaries that the other generations do. They're making considerably, it's not a little bit less, that's considerably less than what we're seeing for other generations. So. That leads to the other problem here, which is lack of savings. So if you look at this chart here, obviously those that are making $160,000, yeah, they've got a lot in their savings account, and they should. But millennials fall into this little red box right here. The problem with that is you're, you don't have money to pay for things, or you don't have money to service your debt. Um, and that, to me, uh, becomes a major problem out there. Now, if we uh, go one step further here, I actually got some, some nice notes I want to um, bring up with you. There we go, the work side. If we go one step further and start to look at the, the gig economy, this is where a lot of this problem stems from. It's, it's a societal issue, but it's also a generational issue. There is this thing called the gig economy. Obviously, we're showing you that millennials weren't making as much money, and that partially has to do with this. You're looking at a system, and I'll use my generation, for example, Generation X, okay? I'm working a nine to five, I'm working eight hours, I've got my health insurance, my 401k, I've got my paid vacation, I've got sick time, I've got all these benefits, you know, I even get a little Christmas bonus in there. The problem with millennials, and this may be because the businesses think this way, or millennials think this way, is that millennials will work, let's say, a five-hour job, a part-time gig. It's not a full-time thing. So they're doing, let's say, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. working at a, at a coffee shop in the morning. But they need to make more money, so they go and take a second part-time job. Maybe they're doing an Uber driver from 2 to 7 p.m. for five hours. The point I'm getting at here is these millennial or the millennials are now working maybe more hours. So this individual here is working 10 hours versus the Gen X is working eight, and they think they're getting all these benefits. The problem is because they're part-time gigs, you're probably not getting health insurance or a 401k 
or paid vacation or sick time. This is a huge part of the problem because now these millennials or people who are in this situation, it doesn't have to be necessarily millennials, it could be Gen X too, you are now taking out-of-pocket expenses to pay for health insurance, right? Maybe you're not getting vacation or sick time. Your 401k is not sponsored, so now you're left to fund your own 401k, but you don't have any money because you got to pay for health insurance and rent and all this stuff. So it's a, it's a pretty crazy cycle to be in, but I think you, you start to realize that it's not just the millennials are lazy. This is the societal position that they're put in. Now, there's things that we can do to help change that, of course, and we'll look at some of those here shortly. So I thought it'd be fun to bring up some nice little Twitter quotes. If you guys want, just type in hashtag millennial retirement plans if you want a great laugh. Some of this is absolutely hilarious. So I, uh, we, we blocked out their names. So I, this one's from Very. It says, Bwahaha. like retirement is feasible. I still can't afford rent at this rate. This is another very, very true item. It says, they would rather rent than own. And I think that this is what the media has focused on, is that millennials would rather rent than own. Yes, Gregory says, lack of opportunities. Yeah, I, I think there are. And employers don't want to have full-time employees because it costs them more money. So let's do part-time. So again, this is the, it's not just the millennials wanting to work the gigs, it's just what they can get. So would they really rather rent than own? I don't think so. Here's home ownership rates to give you an idea of what we've been facing since 1995. Home ownership rates have declined significantly from 2004 to 2016. Now they're on a, the bounce a little bit, but you know why is it that home ownership rates are so low? It's not necessarily that people just don't want to own a home. It actually uh, was a big priority for millennials to own their own home. Problem is prices have gotten so high that it's pricing them out. But here's the flip side of this, which is probably equally as dangerous, is the rent prices. Okay, so if rent prices are continuing to rise and um, and the home prices continue to rise, you're pricing them out of the market. It makes a sig very, very significant challenge. Now, one of the interesting things that we pulled up as far as a fact is, uh, who pulled this report? Yeah, I don't remember. I think it was Black Rocks. And millennials spend nearly $93,000 in rent by the time they turned 30. Now that's $10,000 more than Gen Xers and $21,000 more than baby boomers. So clearly they're spending a lot more money on the rent side of things. That's a very, very significant one. Now you, you want to know about the home ownership rates. I had some facts. I want to read these to you because I can't remember them off the top of my head. It said that 37% of millennials between the age of 25 and 34 own homes. I think that might actually be a shock to most people. Because we get this impression, the media makes us believe that millennials just don't own homes. You just, oh, it's just like, nope, nope, not owning a home. No, they want to own homes, but there's obviously financial constraints that we've addressed that really make it challenging for millennials to own it. Now, we, we said 37% of millennials between uh, 25 and 34 own homes. Is that good or bad compared to other generations? With baby boomers at the same age, it was 45%. So it's definitely a lot less than other generations. Okay, uh, let me keep going here. Another funny Twitter one, and some of these were so dark and eerie, I, we, we didn't even want to post them, but if you, again, if you want to laugh, just go and check that out. It's, it's pretty entertaining. Um, unique advantages and strengths of millennials. Kev says, I know, right? I'm busy right now, maybe later. Is there an app for that? We found this one funny because one of the stats was really focusing on how millennials are very, very tech savvy, right? They're very internet savvy. They spend more time on social media sites than any other generation by far, although Gen Z just passed them with regards to time spent on social media sites and being interactive. The other pieces which I found interesting, and some of these are actually very negative. I'm going to address them one by one. Obviously, internet savvy is great. We need to be thinking as, as investors, really, about the trends of millennials because they're going to drive businesses and companies. So again, this isn't just about the millennials and their trades, but how can we as uh, other generations or even millennials capitalize on their spending habits and interests? So if they're uh, very internet savvy, great. Find out what areas they're looking at. You know, Are they going to be Instagram folks? Are they going to be looking at uh, other new technologies? Awesome. The no broker side of things. I think that this is a reflection of their parents in the dot-com bubbles back in 2000 and obviously the housing crisis in 2008 where brokers just weren't answering their phones, weren't very responsive and underperformed the markets. I mean, for the better part of 17 years, markets did, or your, your parents' accounts didn't do anything. From 2000 to 2013, they basically just sat there. That's 13 years of dormant, did nothing with regards to their retirement accounts. So 
They don't trust brokers. But what I thought was interesting is they like robo-advisors. Millennials more than any other generation are looking towards robo-advisors. These are automated advisors. Really? So hold on a second. You don't want to, you don't want to take financial advice from a human being who actually has gone through and, and, and take certification courses so they can represent information to you. That, that broker is simply a, a speaker box for the firm, right? They're selling you stuff that the firm wants to, to sell and they're getting you to buy stuff that the, the, sorry, they're selling stuff that they want you to buy and they're buying stuff that they want you to sell. That's what a broker does. Why is that different with a robo-advisor? Because you're not dealing with a human being? You don't get to call somebody up? You're still, with a robo-advisor, buying the securities that whatever firm you're signed up with is deciding to sell, and you're selling your own securities when that firm is deciding to buy. Robo-advisor is a digital broker. Why would that be of an area of interest for millennials? I have to say that's a bad idea. More importantly, you should understand how to invest, right? How to make those smart decisions yourself as opposed to letting somebody else who's trying to make money off of your money make the decisions for you. Forget that. Move it. Um, higher level of self-directedness. This one's interesting. Millennials are much more inclined to do it themselves, which I think is an admirable trait. They want to do it themselves. They want to cut out middlemen. They want to kind of focus and do it the right way. Surprisingly, there was a large number of millennials that felt that they were experts in the financial field, to which I have to laugh out loud at. Um, look, I, I've been doing this a, in a long, long time, and I, I, I'm almost to the expert level. I think I'm really good at what I do, but you always have to be learning. So I, I think that to call yourselves an expert in finance and investing is probably a bit of a stretch. Now, what do millennials focus on or what are they looking at? The Twitter quote I gave you guys a minute ago talked about apps. Is there an app for that? Millennials are huge on finding an app that will basically run their finances for them. This is a big thing, which has given rise to some very popular companies. And if you are invested in them, you probably have done very other well. Um, you're looking at things like Acorn or Robinhood, right? A lot of millennials are looking at Acorns as an investment vehicle where you make a purchase, it rounds up, takes that extra change, throws it in some investments for you. My only problem with that is there is back-end stuff you don't see with these services. They are taking um, fees and money from those accounts. Your transactions are always going to be market orders. And while it's a good start to help you in the process or build savings and investments, the investments that you're in or how you buy and sell is probably costing you some money along the way. So at a certain point, a millennial will need to say, okay, I now understand the concept of saving a little bit of money and putting it in the market. Let me learn how to do it myself and not use an Acorns or a Robinhood because the manner in which they execute and access the markets is costing me money. So I will now do that part myself. But at least they're getting started and these apps I think are a great way to help them. Uh, Robo-advisors like Betterment or Wealthfront. I went through and I checked some of these out and it's really comical, okay? One of the things we talk about in, in, in the trading world, certainly here at Online Trading Academy and Power Trading Radio, is when people make bogus claims. This happens a lot. Betterment, right on their website, is making a bogus claim. It's kind of funny. I'll read it to you. Uh, let me make sure I get the exact one here. Where, where was that one, TJ? Da -da -da. Um, so on their website, what Betterment does is it, it gives you a portfolio and says, if you invest in our portfolio, you would have made this much. Of course, I could go back, I could find any stock over the course of time and cherry pick and say, well, if you bought this one, you would have made this much money. See, I would have told you to buy that one. That's not how markets really work. You would have to make that decision back then at that time. So what Betterment was selling you is, you buy our funds, you're going to beat the market in almost all situations. Here's the, here's the rub, and I quote, Betterment would... Hold on a second. Would. That, that, that's a word that means what? That you didn't, that you haven't, but you could. That you would or you should, right? Should have, would have, and could have are three words that mean absolutely nothing in the financial markets. Betterment said, Betterment would have outperformed the average private client investor in almost all periods over the last decade. Learn more on how we did this. They would. They didn't do it. They're showing you a chart that is going back and cherry picking a portfolio that has done historically very well. But they know that now after a decade. So be careful what you're buying into. To me, that is a bogus claim. I can show you every single day a stock that I would have bought 10 years ago that's outperformed every single market. I could do that. But that's not truth. 
Truth is, show me statistics on are you beating as of today? Are your clients beating right now? And the problem we have is you need to make those decisions. Those are tough decisions to make. It revolves around market timing, it revolves around making the uh, right asset selections, and really fitting what is your risk profile. So don't fall for the, the marketing rhetoric from a lot of these firms. Do it yourself. Robo-advisors to me, while it's a nice entryway, it's not the best way. So here's one of the big challenges that we see. There is this trade-off in life where you live for today, but you struggle for tomorrow, right? So this is what a lot of the stats and figures I'm seeing from millennials are showing is that they're, they understand that they're making less than previous generations, but they're not compensating for that. As a matter of fact, they're spending a little bit more than generations normally would have. So you have less income and you're spending more. What that leads to is a significant shortfall in the future. For example, a lot of the facts are saying that millennials are, are happy to go out there and, and again, spend on coffee and spend on nice meals and go out there and spend lavishly. Well, you can't really do that because what that means is down the road at the end, you're going to have probably a very, uh, very small retirement, very small amount of money saved. All right. The flip side of this is when we balance things out, we look and we see, okay, I struggle for today, but I live for tomorrow. You know, do you penny pinch and you don't go out, you don't have any social life, you don't even drink coffee anymore because that was $4. I can't afford McDonald's at a dollar, so I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to drink. I'm drinking water out of the tap and I'm rationing that because I wanna spend, don't want to spend money. I'm eating Top Ramen every night. That's the other extreme. We don't want to put anybody in that situation, but there's a trade-off. And if you go through that super tough struggle today, pay off your student loans with every penny you have and don't go out, well, then you can probably use those good spending habits and save for something very nice down the road. That's the trade-off we have to make and it's tough. That's a challenge and a choice that every, every one of us has to make in our day-to-day -day lives is, okay, what do I spend today or could I save that money and maybe have a better life down the road? A lot of millennials believe that given our current political system and environmental system that the world's gonna be a disaster by the time they retire anyway. So there's an apprehension to invest for the long term. All right, one more poll here. Think you know your millennials? Here's another poll. Approximately how many millennials invest? Surprisingly, 58% uh, said 8 million. It's actually much higher than that. 57% of millennials are actually investing. Now, those are numbers that were pulled by BlackRock, which I thought was uh, a reputable source with regards to investors. Of course, is that their client base? I mean, I don't know where these polls come from. So every survey I, I see, especially for, um, in my mind, I take with a grain of salt. But they are investing. Um, just what are they investing in? So let's talk about wealth creation here. I pulled this one. This is from DC on Twitter under Millennial Retirement Plans. Again, please go there and check it out. It's hilarious. It says, hope my parents plan for my retirement too. I, I literally laughed out loud at this one because, you know, it, it's, a, it's a testament to them knowing that their parents are planning for retirement. Their parents are thinking about it, and this individual is just really not even thinking about it. Then you have, uh, what was, oh, we, I thought we had one more. No? All right, maybe I have one more later. So let me walk you through this matrix. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because some of you have seen this one. If we want to put ourselves in a, in a very good position financially, we have to do a couple different things. We have to, number one, watch our expenses. Number two, we have to start thinking about how we take whatever uh, disposable income or extra I have and put it to work for me. I mentioned earlier that millennials are are really heavy in savings. And the number that came from BlackRock is that millennials might have as much as 70% of their money in cash. While cash is great, it's useless if it's not producing for you. The whole goal of wealth creation, if you look at any of the biggest names in the world, any of them, the richest people in the world, all put their money to work for them. They're taking a dollar and saying, I don't want to just let this sit on my mattress and turn it into 95 cents by the end of the year. I want to take that dollar and have it turn into a buck fifty by the end of the year, or a dollar ten, or a dollar five. But it has to be growing and greater than the rate of inflation. So if you're a millennial or you know millennials who are hoarding cash, stop it. Put it to work for you. Otherwise, you're just losing money. And while you're thinking, "Great, I've got cash," it's depreciating. And the more that our Fed continues to manipulate our rates, it could depreciate even faster. In case a millennial might not understand this, since 1913, the purchasing power of your dollar has dropped 97%. Where's the 93? Who cares? It's over 90. My facts are a little bit off on that. I think it's 90, I think it's 97%. What that should tell you is that the longer you hold dollars in cash, you're losing money. So stop. Find the right investment. So we made this matrix called wealth creation. 
or wealth creation matrix. And the first thing you need to consider is your investments and rate of return. Surprisingly, millennials are very risk averse. And, and I guess not surprisingly, having seen what their parents went through, but they're very risk averse. So we need to think about the right investments to fit each and, in, each and everyone's individual personal preferences. Some of you might be much more risky than others. Some of you might be full on cryptos. I see uh, Mark out here. Um, so we bullish a year for crypto. Yeah, millennials are actually much more inclined to make digital investment, uh, digital asset investments like cryptocurrencies. That was an interesting fact I read as well. But it's about finding the investments and the rate of return that you want and building a portfolio. Number two on this is market timing, something that your financial planners and your advisors will tell you that you cannot do. However, if you look at the charts that we showed of the millennials between 90, well, really just market crash and booms of 2000 and 2008, those that didn't time the markets were basically subject to riding out 50% losses twice. And if you look at where our markets are headed right now, there's a potential for an even bigger drop. And I'll even show you that here in a sec. So market timing becomes key. Understanding that there's a certain point where you gotta say, you know what, this market's gone too far, too fast, too much. I'm gonna get out and buy back cheaper. Simple. There's a good time to go to cash when everything is collapsing so you can now buy more later. But it's about using that cash properly. Expenses and fees. Uh, this is an interesting one. Millennials are actually on top of this. This is an area of strength for them, is they are very fee-centric. They're looking for things for free. Well, remember, when you look for something like for free, like there's a lot of uh, financial sites that are free, they become problematic because they got to make money somewhere. Either the sale of order flow, if you're using some of these online trading firms that are free, uh, the sale of order flow, your orders are always going at market prices, which covers for slippage, and there's issues there. So. While I commend them for looking out and being aware of fees, which can definitely eat away at overall rates of return, it's critical you understand that if I'm getting something with no fee, there's some cost there to me, and what is that? The final one, which is probably the most important for millennials, hands down, is compounding and time. Einstein said it's the, what the most powerful force in the universe is compounding interest. Well, let me show you this. And I just want to put it in perspective, because if you're a millennial right now who hasn't really started savings, I want to show you the impact of how much this is going to hurt you if you keep waiting. I was fortunate enough to have my, my boss, and I worked at a financial planning company at 25 years old, told me, get started today. And I did. I started investing right away, and I was 25, and she said, you're already way ahead of the curve. Here's why. Let's say you put in $100 per month, okay? $100 per month at 8% rate of return, okay? And you invest till you're 65. If you started at 60, you've got almost nothing, right? You got seven grand in the bank. If you started at 50, you have $35,000 in the bank. If you started at 40, you're at 96. If you started at 30, which is where most millennials are gonna be right now, you're at 232. Now, we know that's not enough to retire on, right? It's not the, like you're gonna be set for life, but it's still, you have some money down the road as opposed to living for today and not having that money. If you started at 20, it's $530,000. Now at the bottom, what you'll notice, uh, and I didn't highlight this, but I should have, the point I want you to see is the amount of interest earned. It's the middle line at the bottom table in blue. If you started earlier, it's pretty much all interest gained, right? Uh, if you started at age 20, you invested $54,000 over 45 years. And that's only $100 per month. I think we can all afford $100 per month. There just goes a couple ice mocha frappuccinos and a couple Happy Meals and you got yourself 100 bucks at the end of the month. That's $476,000 in interest. That's free money. Now just think if you put $54,000 underneath your pillow because you're being cautious and you're afraid of the markets, what happens when you retire at 65? You have $54,000 in cash, which is lost in purchasing power and is probably only worth about $30,000 now. So don't put it under your pillow and save for cash. All right. Last part, market timing. I wanted to bring this one up because I, I've used this image so many times because it's so powerful to me and the perma bulls, the people who said markets only go up, always negate this. They don't want to address it. If you notice from 1995 to 2000, which is right as those millennials were you know, youngsters and maybe even teenagers, we had a 250% rally in their accounts. Your parents were probably going, yeah, baby, let's buy some new, to well, back then, it's like, I'm buying the new Toyota Camry, right? You're buying the new hot new car out there. But we dropped 50%. In two years, you dropped 50%. That is an unbelievable loss of capital. So your parents went from happy to sad. Then we rallied another 105%, right? So you had it spike up, 57% drop in a year. 
We are in the midst right now of a 342% plus rally. This actually goes back to 2018. We breached the 3,000 mark, so we're already, we got even higher than that, okay? It's critical to understand that if we look at patterns, we know that history repeats itself. Can anybody in this room, does anybody believe that we are going to continue to spike aggressively from here? Or do you think that we're going to see a red blip like we have in the past? I am a firm believer that we're going to see a sharp decline. I don't know how far down, right? I don't know where it's going to drop to, but markets, history, price movement would tell us that we are going to experience another red box like we have in the past. And if it does happen and you are fully invested in the markets, you're going to lose a lot of money. Our attitude is time the markets, going back to that. Make sure that when we start to roll over, you're not going to get out at the dead high. Don't even try. But you might be able to get out when the market drops, let's say 10%, and then the market drops another 40, and you're just sitting in cash saying, I'm going to buy when it drop bottoms out here and starts to turn back up. So for your peer group who just has a buy and hold forever, they're going to lose a lot of money and spend years to get back up to those highs. But if you're proactive and time the markets, you will capitalize on that downside move by not being in it. Or if you're regressive like me, you will go short that market and make money when it drops by using shorting techniques, using options or different asset classes. So don't sit there idly. Market timing is key. And this picture to me speaks volumes that it's coming. We don't know when, but it is coming. Mark my words. I guarantee, I am guaranteeing there will be a significant market correction. It's just a matter of when. Is it, is it next week, next year, next decade? I don't know. I think it's going to be sooner than that, uh, but it is coming. So I wanted to end this with two little graphics I just added to into this one because I think it's telling of the generation of millennials and the attitudes of millennials. If you look at this one, it shows you that the stock market is the favorite long-term investment generator or vehicle by generation. Silent generation, 44% in the stock market, which is interesting because they really should be in bonds at that age. Uh, baby boomers, 38%, and Gen X, 33%. Millennials, their favorite asset class is cash. I, this, this really scares me. Yes, William uh, says, short, baby. Yes, learn to short. If you do not know what shorting is, click the link at the end of the video here, and we'll teach you more about shorting. But being in cash, guys, I love holding cash. I, don't get me wrong. I have a lot of cash, but I also have a vast majority of my money in the markets invested, right? Whether it's going to be in stocks, I'm in bonds, I'm in cryptocurrencies, I have some futures, I have Forex, I have options. I, I spread my investment. I real estate. I spread mine around significantly, but I always have some cash. The key here is that I'm not saying 80% of my capital is in cash. That'd be crazy. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of, uh, of production. One last image here. And this one to me was very eye-opening. This is from Wells Fargo. What I want you to focus on is on the far left, or far right-hand side, you see we've got the millennials. So the baby boomers on the left side, um, they pretty much are in line with their target date fund. For those of you who might not know what a target date fund is, it is a pre-built portfolio that says, if you are going to retire at this date, we are going to automatically allocate and change the allocations of this portfolio based off of historical retirement portfolio model. So um, the target date fund for, gen or for millennials says they should have 5% in cash. Millennials are running at 14.2% cash. That's way, way, way too much for somebody who should be aggressive for the future. This is the one that really shocked me though. The target date fund has 6% in fixed income, in bonds. Millennials are almost 13%. That's almost double the historical normal. That tells me that they're risk averse and they're looking for that safety, which guys, if you're investing in the bond market right now, safety is not a key word. It is one of the more dangerous ones to be in because we had an overly inflated and supported market by our central banks and Fed. And when they back out, we could see that bubble pop and those bonds could take a big hit. Um, they're also very underweighted in stocks. And it says other here. I'm not exactly sure what category other is. It says commodities and, and public real estate. So they're a little bit higher in that category. But surprisingly, staying out of the equity market, which um, is another interesting fact or, or piece for our markets continuing in their direction. With the, if this big buying group is not buying in the stock market, that could be um, pushing things to the downside. All right. So we covered a lot here, and I, I think I'm kind of right on my, my time mark here. I want to go and show you the next steps. And, I, and this is a little bit small. I'll read it out to you. It's kind of funny. Again, this is from Twitter. L says, next steps, work myself to death since health care is a debt sentence and Social Security won't exist by the time I'm of retiring age. Or just wait for the nuclear apocalypse. Funny, but not so funny. 
Uh, tech says hope for the best. That's, that's not what you do. Uh, I have a firm belief system that one of the most foul, vile, disgusting four-letter words that you can use is hope. Right? Don't use it. Hope tells me that you don't have a plan, that you're just going, ah, I hope it works. No, have a plan in place. So from our perspective, your next step should be rather simple. Find a balance between present and future needs and desires. All right? Start with your current consumption patterns. I, I use an app where it tracks all my personal in uh, income and spending. If you find that you're spending a lot of money on things that you really just don't need, then maybe you could save that money and pay down some of your credit card debt. Your goal should be to get rid of that credit card debt before you do anything. And then let's start learning how to put your capital to use, right? Learn how to trade and invest. Don't sit in cash. That might have been the, the theme song for the, the title for this webinar. Just don't sit in cash, right? Don't have all your assets in cash. It's a waste. Learn how to trade and invest. Whether you want to be super conservative or hyper risky, learn how to do it in any direction. Whether that market's moving up like your history books have told you or more importantly how they move them in a down market. How to short. Or use options. I had a great conversation with a guest on the show recently where basically the market was just going sideways for seven months and the guy was pulling money out all the time because of using an option strategy where you get paid if the security goes nowhere and you just go sideways. There are ways you can do that using options. So find out how to use different asset classes in an up market, down market, and a sideways market. And the real key here is get started today, right? Get started today, don't waste time thinking about it, hoping about it, be proactive. The only thing we know for certain, they say, is death and taxes. And, well, as you've seen from many of our politicians, <laughs> you can evade taxes. Death is a little more challenging to overcome. So get started today. Make sure that you understand what you're doing. Look at your retirements. Plan your investments. Understand market timing. Watch those fees. Compounding and time is going to be your ally on your side, and hopefully that will help change your financial future. So for you, for you millennials out there, it's that balance. Right? Live for today or live for tomorrow. You, you can't have both. You want to kind of find out which way to teeter it. From what we've seen through the statistics, millennials in many cases are teetering that balance towards, I'm living more towards today. A lot of that is societal, right? Your jobs are paying you less. You have a gig economy. You don't have all these benefits. So what I would do if I was a millennial in that situation, I would simply sit down with a couple pieces of paper and map out. On one of them, I'd have my employment, right? What am I going to do for my work? Am I going to continue with the gig economy? Or am I going to take that step and maybe try to find, put a concerted effort to find a full-time job that gives me all those benefits? So now I have a 401k to help pay for retirement, right? I can also have my health benefits covered, and that cost is no longer my personal expense that comes from work. That's the work side. Next paper, I want to look at investments. Write down, what am I doing? What do I have? Do I have got a car? Do I have uh, collectibles? Do I have cash? Do I have bond stocks? Map everything out and find out how we can take that and make it grow for us. If you have a large amount of money sitting in cash and you look over at your credit cards and you have a lot of credit card debt, shame on you. Pay that off right away. Even if it means going very low on your cash for right now, get rid of that credit card debt. And if you find yourself in a position where you're saying, I need to use my credit cards to sustain my lifestyle because I don't make enough money, then you need to make changes to your lifestyle or change the amount of income that you're getting. It's a simple formula. But it needs to be one of those thought out processes, not I hope it works out or I hope my parents take care of me. We have to be proactive and do this ourselves. And with a little bit of effort, we can certainly change our financial future. All right, guys, I hope you uh, got some good information out of that. There's a lot of great statistics you were brought up. Uh, hopefully it maybe changed your perspective of the generation of millennials just a little bit. There's a lot to think about, and I tell you, every time I turn on the TV, they're slamming millennials like nobody's business. I think they're in a good spot. I think they've got a lot of challenges, but you know what? Those challenges can be easily overcome with a little bit of effort and a lot of education, understanding how these things work. Uh, if you'd like to, like to know more about long-term investing, how to fix your credit, understanding all the different variables we talked about today, you can go to otacademy.otawebinar.com uh, OTWebinar, to find out more information about anything we discussed today. So thank you guys so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Take care.